Hey everyone, my name is Rachel, and I'm afraid I have to start this video by offering up a little correction to my last Ken Ham video with my Creation for Kids series. Turns out Ken Ham doesn't actually have three volumes of his Answers for Kids books. There are so many more! At the minute I have six volumes downloaded, and I'll be honest, they just get worse and worse, but this is kind of exciting because it means even more videos on this ridiculous topic. It turns out the books all have like a different theme as well. So today we're going to be mixing it up a little bit and we're going to be looking at volume 3, which is answers about God and the Bible. I thought it would be a fun one. So let's just jump into some of these questions. The first one I want to address is one of the big questions of all time. Why did God create us? Ken Ham jumps in there straight away equating this question to other questions like what is my purpose, why did God create me, and so on. Now before we even look at Ken's answer, I want to throw out what I, as an atheist, believe. I don't think we were created by God obviously, because I don't think a God exists. And I also don't think we have some big reason, some big overarching kind of purpose for being here. I just personally think life is what it is, and it's up to us as individuals to find our own meaning in it. It's up to us to use the time that we have to make ourselves happy, to do what makes us happy, and to make other people happy as well. And I think that's as good a reason as any to be here, to be honest. But let's see what Ken has to say. His answer reads, the answer is very simple and very clear in the Bible. God created us to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. We were created by him and for him. Hmm. So basically, we're just God's little pawns. We're here to make him feel better about himself. I mean, this might seem like an extreme example, but how is that any different to those creeps who like have kids and then trap them in a basement and abuse them and never let them leave and stuff? Like, I'm sorry, but if that's the entire meaning of life, it just feels like a bit of a letdown, to be honest. Seems like a bit of a scam. I don't want to spend my entire existence being a servant or a slave to someone just because apparently I owe him something. Ken goes on and writes, he did not need us because he was lonely or wanted someone to talk to. <laughs> God is perfect and complete and has always been that way. We belong completely to him, because of that, we are to glorify him in everything that we do. Really? And what exactly has God done that's so great? Assuming he's real, what has he done to deserve us glorifying him? Again, Ken goes on saying that apparently we as people have to love him, obey him, believe in Jesus Christ, trust in Jesus, receiving the free gift Jesus offers us. Only then will we have glory to God, only then we will be able to enjoy him forever, for all eternity. I mean, he really sells it, he kind of makes it sound good, but again, he's saying a lot of words without actually saying much. It's kind of a pattern that Ken Ham has. Um, I just can't help but think this is a really dangerous thing to be teaching kids. We're just telling them to blindly follow someone, to blindly serve someone without questioning them or their motives or why they're doing it. I'd much rather one day when I have a kid, eventually, in the very, 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 very distant future. Um, I'd much rather teach my kid to think for themselves and to come to their own conclusions about other people, about themselves, and about how they want to treat people. I want to teach my kid to treat people well because they want to be nice to the other person, because they want to make the other person feel good. I don't want to tell them to be nice to someone just because someone else says they should. I think the kind of parents who go around saying, because I say so, it's not really doing anything to help the kid, it's not teaching them why or explaining the why. And, and I think that's kind of like a really important thing to tell kids. I mean, <laughs> this is gonna sound really silly, but I kind of compare it to owning a dog. Like, I'd never just expect a dog to obey me just because I own him. Like, when I was growing up, my family had this absolutely beautiful Cocker Spaniel called Jasper. He was about six years old when we adopted him, and he was just, he was my best friend in the world, I loved him so much, he was absolutely perfect and beautiful and lovely. But, before he came to live with us, he didn't have the happiest of lives. So, it took him a while to settle in, and... You know, I'll be honest, there wasn't really any reason why he should have just obeyed us straight away just because we were his new owners. As with all dogs and with all kind of other people and living things really, it's a two-way relationship and that's what we had to do with Jasper. We had to earn his love and his trust and we had to show him kindness, we had to show him love, we had to show him generosity and in return he offered us love and warmth and companionship and he was an amazing addition to our family. It's like with any dog, he'll follow your commands if in return you listen to his needs. That's how relationships work, not just with a dog but with other people as well. 
And I think this might kind of be the message that Ken Ham's trying to get across, or this could be the message that maybe he should be trying to get across, but as usual he just sort of misses the mark. Basically he's just saying if someone does something for you once then you should unconditionally follow them and do everything they say without question regardless of how they treat you from then on. And I don't think that's something we should be teaching kids. And it's even worse because he's he's not just saying that we should blindly follow someone who did us a favour, he's saying that is our whole purpose for being here, that is the whole reason we're alive. And I think that's a really awful thing to be teaching kids. I just, I don't, I don't like it and I don't agree with it. The next question I want to address involves teaching kids that anecdotal evidence is apparently more valid than objective data. Obviously I don't agree with this and it makes me pretty angry. So the kids, again if they're real, uh, they're, one of them poses this question saying how did the authors of the bible know what all God did during the I think this is written a bit weird. How did the authors of the Bible know what all God did during the creation? Since there was no one to see what he did, how do we know what really happened? I feel like this book needs a proofreader. Basically the question is how do people know God was the creator and what happened and stuff? Um, now any other person might try and explain this by talking about the evidence and why if they do want to use the Bible as a source they have to try and show why it's a credible source, why it's reliable, why it's accurate. But not Ken Ham. He just uses it as an opportunity to bitch about scientists and the theory of evolution. Pretty typical, really. So he writes, There are people who believe in evolution who think that billions of years ago, when no one was there to see, the universe came into existence by a big bang. Then billions of years ago, when no one was there to see, the earth came into existence. Then billions of years ago, when no one was there to see, life formed on earth. Then millions of years ago, Still no one there to see. Animals began changing into other animals. Then two million years ago, yep, still no one there. An animal like an ape began to change into a human being. That's their story, but there wasn't anyone around to see it. Nice one, Ken. Good job patronizing the kids there. Good job completely ignoring why most people think all of that about evolution. Good job ignoring evidence. Good job not talking about fossils, or dating techniques, or DNA evidence, and so on and so on. He just ignores it, and he's just like, ha ha ha, let's laugh at these silly people. And it's so patronising and stupid, and I think it's a terrible way to try and teach kids anything. Don't teach them to laugh at people just because you don't agree with them. That's stupid. Anyway, he goes on. Well, guess what? In the Bible we are told that God has given his word to men to write down so we can know how everything came to be. The Bible, which is God's word, though penned by man, tells us that God was there and he has given us eyewitness account of exactly how the universe and everything in it was created. The Bible tells us thousands of times that it is the word of God. So what you're saying is that the Bible and the Bible alone tells you that the Bible is a reliable account of everything. So basically you're telling kids to take everything they read at face value and not question the source. You're telling kids that they only ever need to look at one piece of evidence. And here's the thing, Kent. You never address, regardless of whether God's real or not, and we all know that I don't think he is, but that's out of the picture for a minute. You never address how you actually know the Bible are his words. How do you know it wasn't faked? You know what, I can just sit here now and, um, yeah, look, I, I have this card that Dan wrote for me. Um, and, it, and it says, um, yeah, these are my words. I am Dan, and I want you all to know that Rachel is the coolest girl in the world and you should all subscribe to her YouTube channel because she, she's really, really great. And you should do that because I, Dan, told you to do that. And you can trust that I wrote this because I'm telling you that I wrote this. Love, Danny. See, that's everything he definitely, definitely wrote in here. Now, how do you actually know that Dan wrote that? You don't. How do you actually know that any of this is accurate or real or reliable? You don't. Now apply that exact same logic to the Bible. And how do you know that God wrote that? You don't. To believe that the Bible is God's words, you need some evidence outside of the Bible itself. It's as simple as that. Anyway, Ken finishes his answer by saying, My question to you is, do you trust God who knows everything, who has always been there, who never changes, and who doesn't tell a lie? Or a human being who doesn't know everything, changes his mind, changes his story, and wasn't always there? Well, I believe God, and that makes real sense. Well, when you put it like that, I guess, yeah, God, but no! 
Except it's not like that, is it, Ken? The real question should be, do you trust an anecdotal story in a book with no corroborating evidence, or do you trust a theory which is supported by objective data and evidence, which does change and does get updated as new evidence is found? Because, well, I believe the evidence and that makes real sense. Ken, you're silly. Actually, you know what, I went a bit further on in the book and it does kind of address this whole Bible being true, Bible being written by God thing. Uh, let's take a look at this other question which reads, just why is the Bible true? I believe it, but I just don't understand why it's true. Well, for a start, I'd tell the kid, don't just believe something without understanding why it's true. First ask questions, get the answers, then come to your own conclusions. That's the best thing to teach a kid, right? And that's definitely what Ken says. No, no, that's not what Ken says. I don't get it, Ken. You wouldn't want to intentionally mislead a kid, would you? Because apparently he does, because he writes, The Bible is no ordinary book for many reasons. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, tells us that the Bible is God's inspired word. Blah blah blah, blah blah blah, God breathed out some stuff, blah blah blah. If the Bible is from God, we would expect it to be true, and we should be able to test it. True, good point, interesting, okay. So, let's have a look at testing this, shall we? We can do this in many ways. In Genesis chapters 1 to 11, we can read an account of many historical events concerning the beginning of the world. Through application of science, we can confirm that God's account of creation is true. As an example, God tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that animals, plants, birds, fish, and every living thing were created after their own kind. Dogs can only produce dogs, etc. This is exactly what we observe. Please stop misleading kids. And seriously, please give us a solid definition of what this kind is supposed to be. What is a kind? What are kinds of animals? That's not a real term. That's not a real thing. Until you can give me a solid objective definition of it, then I can't listen to anything about it. I mean, I know this is a kid's book, but even kid's books define key terms. Kinds is such a stupid, loose, meaningless term. It doesn't actually mean anything. But while we're on this subject, I'd like to know what a lot of creationists think about this idea of like wolves and dogs and stuff. Do you believe that wolves and dogs are the same kind or are they different kinds? Like what do they think of, and I'm simplifying, but like dogs being basically domesticated descendants of wolves? Do they think that's the case or are they like, no, they're different kinds? It's, it just all seems silly to me. I think this is just a blatant lie to kids here. There's not real evidence. But Ken goes on and says, We are also able to confirm many aspects of the Bible's history in other areas of science, such as geology and astronomy. And then he leaves it there, without giving any actual evidence. Again, I know it's a kid's book, but you can't just say, There's evidence, and then not present any evidence. You know, some specifics would be good. We can also rely on the Bible's truth concerning Jesus, for instance, in considering how many prophecies about him were made hundreds of years before he came to Earth as a man. No. Because we can confirm history in the Bible, we can have faith in all that the Bible has to say. However, the main reason we can trust the Bible is because it's from God, which is different from every other book on earth. We should use the Bible as a starting point for our living, learning and actions. Circular logic again, please stop, it doesn't work. I feel like I'm getting a little bit angry here. <laughs> no, but this is a terrible answer. It says a terrible example for kids and it doesn't actually answer or explain anything. But that's pretty typical for Ken Ham really, isn't it? But anyway, that's where I'm going to end this video today. Trust me, there will be a lot more videos on this topic because I'm only just getting started on these books, which are ridiculous. In the next video, we are going to be addressing the question of why the Bible is the only true religious holy book and, and Christians are right and everyone else is wrong. It's a stupid answer, as usual. But we're going to be looking at that in the next video. And it might be this weekend, it might be early next week, I'm not sure yet. But I'm just going to kind of play it by ear and see what happens. But for now, thank you so much for watching. Please leave me your comments and let me know what you thought of this video and every other video in this series. And let me know your thoughts on anything Ken Ham related and anything me related. Leave me some comments, they're nice to read. And please don't forget to subscribe if you like this video and want to see more from me because it makes me happy. If you've made it through this far, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you again soon.